Hello. G'day, g'day. Welcome to the podcast. Your name is Joey. What's your real last name? Remini. Remini. Yep. Okay. Because I, I was like, I'm pretty sure it's not Lepidus. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you have it? Have it? Your name is Joey Lepidus. Well, I did a shamanic, a shamanic like you know. Ritual. Women's journey. Okay. And we chose a power animal. Oh no, no, the, you sort of a power animal comes to you. I won't say you chose it. Okay. But leopard had special meaning for me that I related to. Mm-hmm. And I thought, um, yeah, I sort of didn't want my life on Facebook, so I have a Facebook identity and then a professional identity. Okay, cool. So, what was the what was the shamanic thing? How did, how did that work? It was. It's, it's a beautiful thing. It's called the School of Shamanic Women Craft. Um, and you commit to a one year long journey and it's a structure, like it's guided by a group of women. And over a year we, we camped in the Otways six times and different moons, full moon, new moon, equinoxes, solstices, and women sit in circle and listen and share stories. So it's about non advice giving and Mm -hmm. unconditional support holding and yeah, being in nature. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For a whole year. For a whole year. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. Cool. Down in the Otways. Yeah, and you became a leopardist there. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what, what do you do professionally? So my profession is supporting people with vertigo and tinnitus. Mm-hmm. And vertigo referring to not fear of heights, but rather feeling that you're moving when you know logically you're still. Mm-hmm. So people could be sitting or lying or walking or standing, but they feel like they're on a boat or like they're spinning or falling or pushing or pulling so it's incredibly debilitating gives you like nausea can do Mm. can have nausea dominating dominating vomiting or diarrhea so Mm -hmm. the fight flight and freeze responses yeah and um tinnitus is ringing sounds or any type of sound that you hear in your body that other people can't hear Mm -hmm. and super common but only, you know, maybe 2% of the population that can hear their tinnitus find it distressing, like to the point of severe anxiety or suicidal thoughts. Yeah. But actually hearing your own body sounds is super normal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's kind of interesting because as a meditator, I hear that that the ringing in the ears, that sound mm. and the way that I've been, it's been described to me as the sound of nature manifesting. Mm-hmm. Have, you, have you heard that before? That no. explanation for it? You haven't heard that? No. Okay, yeah, so it's, it's kind of interesting. I know I want to find out more about what t- tinnitus is. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Yeah, and... Well, there's different ways to say it. In Australia, we say tinnitus, America, tinnitus. Okay, cool, yeah. And, yeah, how you treat that and mm-hmm. what it does, what does it do to you? Well, nothing. So, essentially, you've got, like, the ears are amazing. My specialty is in the inner ears. That's mm-hmm. my university background and my master's. Yeah. And they're, like, busy little factories, And there's a lot of different salty fluids moving around the ears. And that salty fluid is knocking little like hair cilia, which Mm -hmm. on a microscope look like beds of seaweed floating. Yeah. And so the ears themselves have like 60,000 moving parts when you count all the neurons firing. Yeah, Yeah, there's three of the body's tiniest bones. Mm -hmm. You've got the outer ear, which you can play with. The ear canal that takes you to the eardrum in the middle ear, which you can think of as a carport. So it's an airfield middle ear cavity protecting us from weather. And the air vibration sounds travel from the outside world through the outer ear, middle ear, and then they're transferred through the inner ear via fluid movement and these seaweed beds. Mm-hmm. So the ear itself is making sound, like the mechanics, it's like a factory. Yeah. So if you think about a washing machine working, it's making noise, right? Mm-hmm. So a functional healthy ear is actually like moving a huge amount of vibrations. Yeah. And as an audiologist, we can actually test the sounds that your ear is generating. And so this is internal sound. So it really is a natural phenomena, Mm -hmm. totally normal. But then from the inner ear to the brain, you can have other sounds generated along neural impulses and neural pathways. Yeah. And if they become perceived as a threat or a danger, the brain can latch onto them almost like an addictive pathway Mm -hmm. and keep triple checking it, double checking it, becomes very hypervigilant and afraid of it and worried about it and why is it like this and so the big the abnormal connotations begin Mm -hmm. and this is often happens unfortunately for clients who have maybe had a head cold or a knock to the head or something's happened that's been a shock and then the tinnitus has started like this and they associate the tinnitus with the injury 
Yeah. And then it can become incredibly distressing and people get worried that what if I have a brain tumour or what if it's a sign I'm dying? Because of the ringing in the ears. Yeah. Or when, the, the ringing in the head. Both. Yeah. And because the medical world will often say, you know, there's nothing we can do, there is no cure, try this hearing aid or try this anxiety medication and go home. They're mm. really not getting this, the accurate information or support they need to help the centers of the brain filter it out again. Mm -hmm. So if you think about noise cancellation, if you've got those noise cancellation headphones, yep. the brain can do a very similar thing where it'll recognize the tinnitus sound is irrelevant, unhelpful, not useful. It's just like base level, mm -hmm. you know, not, not um, meaningful sound. Yeah. And the brain will actually filter it out and cancel it just out. Just normalize it. Yeah, using mm. its internal mechanisms. And they are broken for people with severe fear-based tinnitus. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's almost like a post-traumatic stress response. For it. some people it is. Not mm. all of them, but yes, absolutely. And um, so I support people through better understanding their body, literally listening to their body, like, here, what's your body telling you? What's this all about? What's the underlying emotional need or spiritual message? Yeah. And through that process of curiosity, opening up, leaning in, rather than pushing and fighting and suppressing and numbing, yep. uh, we find ways to reset the brain pathways and, and re, um, basically heal and re-educate those filters mm -hmm. so they can work again. I, I remember feeling like I can relate to hearing that noise very loudly, especially when I've been scared maybe in bed late at night yeah. and you hear something drop in the house, something b bangs around in the kitchen or, mm -hmm. and, and instantly your whole body goes paralytic, you're paralyzed mm -hmm. and you can't move and you're hyper vigilant and that noise just goes, yeah, and that's all you can hear. It's like the mm -hmm. loudest noise in the world. Yeah. So I can definitely relate to hearing it and, yeah. and you see. see and, what... and, you know, I've certainly heard my own tinnitus and it can be popping sounds, crackling sounds. For me, it's often static, mm -hmm. like an, an untuned old radio or TV. Yeah. And the loudest I ever had it, it sounded like I was, I was hiking in a tiny little, let's say, tin refuge, like a tin roof shed yeah. and really heavy ra um, rain on top. Mm -hmm. So it was that kind of intensity. Yeah. And it's... It did bother me and I was very anxious and distressed when I first heard my tinnitus because I was in my master's degree at the University of Melbourne studying audiology, learning about tinnitus, reading about it, and they were basically telling us, you've got to live with it, you've, you know, mm -hmm. there is no cure. And I was like, oh, my God, and just getting – suddenly my awareness yeah. was very much tuned into that. Mm -hmm. Previously, I hadn't even noticed it. Mm. But then once I tuned into the noise my ears were making and then got told – for some people, it never goes away. It was like, you know, I started to really feel that anxiety of, oh, my God, I'm one of those people. Yeah. And then using my yoga background and my mindfulness background, I realized I could actually toy with it and I could make it louder or softer and start to really mm -hmm. play with it rather than be victim to it. Yeah. And that really was the beginning of me looking at tinnitus through a different way professionally to how my peers viewed it. Mm hmm so so, that, and so then you start to treat the way you treat it. Is it pretty much you've developed this yourself? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So a lot of audiologists are specialists in uh, hearing t tests mm -hmm. and potentially different diagnostic tests, looking at different parts of the ears and the inner ear function and certainly fitting hearing aids. Mm. And I chose really early on to not work with hearing aids and I didn't quite gel with some of the ethics of selling and upselling and, and things like that in a health context. I, yeah. was, I was really interested in heart-centered and patient-centered care, mm -hmm. which empowers the client to make choices and navigate their health rather yeah. than being told by an expert, you need this, buy this, you know, blah, blah. Uh -huh. So I veered off really early on into studying the balance organs and vestibular conditions. And so the hearing organs and the balance organs are like two separate bedrooms that sit side by side in the ear. Mm -hmm. And they're independent, which means you could have zero hearing and perfect balance or zero balance and perfect hearing. So mm -hmm. they're actually separate. And I, through, through my master's degree and my internship at the INL Hospital and the University of Melbourne Balance Clinic, I started to see that there were a lot of people falling through the cracks of the conventional system and sort of being told you know, go home and deal with it. There's nothing more we can do. Mm -hmm. And so that was when I just, I, I learned that through my psychology background and my yoga and mindfulness training, which was really intensive, mm -hmm. that 
there was actually a lot more holistic integrated options we could support clients to explore Mm -hmm. to help them understand their body and give them sleep strategies and even ways to reduce muscle tension around their shoulder and neck as well as emotional and mental strategies to deal with persistent thoughts worries fears Mm -hmm. and when you have chronic symptoms like you might know people with chronic pain yeah Similar to that, you get angry, you get frustrated, you get depressed, you feel isolated, you feel like you can't do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And so having strategies to actually go, you know what, maybe I need to go slowly, but I can do it. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, maybe I can't do it today, but that doesn't mean that I can't work towards it next week. Mm -hmm. So giving people strategies to physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually support their sensory impairment healing is kind of where I I created a a new avenue for people. Yeah. So cool. Mm. So how did you then go get into the yoga and stuff like that? Yeah. How, that, what was that story? <laughs> it's going way back. So I was, mm. my mum always did yoga. So I grew up with always having it as a kind of a regular thing, I suppose. Mm-hmm. I think my first yoga class I ever attended was when I was eight. Yeah, right. Because I had a sick day from school and mum took me to her yoga class and I sat in the corner and watched all the ladies doing yoga. Mm-hmm. And I was, like most girls, I loved gymnastics and dancing, but I didn't like the sequins and the makeup and the, you know, fake tan. And so I, when I was 15, I said to mum, I think I want to do yoga for myself. And so I started a weekly yoga class at 15 and I started mm-hmm. reading the Light on Yoga text mm-hmm. by Mr. Iyengar, which I totally recommend if anyone's out there and is curious. It's a great book to read. It's written in the 60s and it has a, a lot of the history and philosophy of yoga. Yeah. And then by the time I was 18, I started a daily practice Mm -hmm. of about 45 minutes. Mm. And then when I was 26, I took up yoga teacher training in Melbourne at the Clifton Hill Yoga Studio, which was at that time I was dedicating about five hours a day for three years. Yeah, right. So it was 6 a.m. starts and then often either observing, supporting or participating in yoga teaching of some form between 6 and 9 p.m. at night. Mm Mm-hmm. So I was, I was really thirsty for knowledge and curious to learn more about neuroplasticity, which is the body's ability to change and remap itself, and experiential learning, which means you're not learning from books, you're actually learning from problem solving in your body. Mm-hmm. And no one else has the answers except you, so you've got to figure it out yeah. in a step-by-step fa- um, kind of problem solving mindset. Mm-hmm. You're gaining the, the knowledge from the experience. Yeah. Mm. And it's almost like your knowledge, you can only learn so much as you can ask questions. So it's, mm-hmm. it's not always about the answers, but also about what questions do you have and how curious can you get? Yeah. So mm. even when you have an injury, it's like, all right, well, what's this knee injury teaching me about the knee? So mm-hmm. it's like you're learning about anatomy by feeling. Yeah. And often mm. pain, unfortunately, is the strongest form of mind-body communication going on. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's um it's it's very interesting too it's and the most powerful the most powerful way to learn as well mm-hmm. is through that self-inquiry and and obviously rather than just reading it out of a book sort of sort of thing so mm. yeah so you were doing five hours a day for three years more or less yeah we yeah. we had workshops on sundays and weekends it was I mean, you could make it as intense as you wanted, but I was a particularly intense student and just yeah. very dedicated and at the time of my teacher training, yeah, my brother had just become a quadriplegic. So I kind of had that life-death experience of going, gosh, you know, anything could happen tomorrow. You can't take for granted, mm-hmm. you know, your health. And so I had just graduated audiology and was working full-time and very quickly realized it was not filling my cup. It was not my soulful calling. Mm-hmm. I needed more. And so... Almost immediately, I went part time in audiology and took up this intensive training for yoga to deepen my knowledge. Yeah. Because by that point, I already had over 10 years yoga experience. Mm-hmm. So I decided to go a lot deeper into yoga to see how I could incorporate the Eastern holistic experiential healing modalities yeah. to complement my Western audiological vestibular background. And Yeah. What, what's the main thing you took from that, do you think? From the yoga? Yeah, from like putting them together. Um, or just, just developing the holistic thing in the first place? I think what I learned, and this is interesting because, you know, you only know life through your own eyes, you, you know, and as 
the more I was working in the world of audiology and, you know, I, I was so lucky to be surrounded by elite medical specialists in neurology, in surgery and removing brain tumours mm -hmm. and also PhDs in vestibular physiotherapy and psychologists and psychiatrists. And I had amazing exposure to highly trained and specialised and passionate people. Mm. And I was noticing that a lot of those people didn't have a holistic approach. You know, they they were highly specialised in one little piece of the pizza pie yeah. and doing an amazing job at that. But they didn't seem to be that holistic approach that sat the client down and said, you know what, you're the expert in you. Mm -hmm. And it's by you giving us feedback on what's working for you and not to, what's not working yeah. that we can create an integrated and cohesive daily program together that really gets you to where, wherever your goals are. Yeah. So rather than um, seeing a neurologist and getting a brain scan that's interpreted or seeing a psychologist and talking about anxiety and depression but perhaps not looking at the vestibular pathways that need rehabilitating or some of the, the physical other aspects – or seeing a physiotherapist and getting bedside exercises but not talking about thoughts and emotions. Yeah. It's like all these little pieces are falling through the cracks. Mm -hmm. And I guess having the yoga background and understanding empowerment, self-study, the importance of a daily practice, the importance of asking questions and the importance of taking control of your life, mm -hmm. that I think put me in a really special position to see it differently. Yeah. Because the way the Western world and the medical model is set up, it is a handball, mm. you know. It's you very do, fragmented. Yes, and you mm. do what you can and then you refer on and then you do what you can and you refer on. And mm. so the poor patient's getting little tiny pieces, but it's not integrated. Yeah, yeah. So that mm. that's what I learned, I think, is is that kind of fragmentation and how I think with time we're getting a lot better Yeah. Um, as a medical world. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, th I think there's a, we can be very hopeful about how there's incredible research being done in neuroplasticity, in mindfulness, in meditation. Um, and I think it's really validating how this complements and empowers people to get better results in working in conjunction with their medical specialists. That's win-win. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the way of the future for sure. Yeah, there has to be, the awareness has to be, in the person getting healed. Otherwise it's mm. kind of pointless, isn't it? To just give a blanket, a blanket prescription to one condition without considering all the other variables within the person. And yeah. I remember I went to the doctor a couple of weeks ago and was speaking about different foods that I couldn't eat. Mm. And he was um, conf like, looked at me quite confused when I said, oh, I can't eat this and I can't eat that. And um, he didn't really consider that I considered that I that it didn't feel good in my body and I didn't have the reason but I just know that mm. I, I can't eat that food and he was just like well you can try doing this or try and doing that but I was like I just told you that I can't do that <laughs> you know so mm. it's like it's interesting to see that that people have a very tunnel vision of what's right and what's wrong and there's no consideration for the individual and what their experience of it is yeah and I think validating that what people feel is real mm. so if you're feeling not quite right which is the biggest complaint my clients would give me yeah and they'll be like i can't even describe it i just don't feel like i'm in my body mm -hmm. you know like that astronaut feeling or a spaced out feeling or a push pull or rock and sway yeah. or like they're not connected to their legs or their feet you know and i'm like you're not crazy and you're not inventing that your neural pathways through your body your spinal cord your ears your eyes and your brain are telling you that it's invisible to the doctors and their tests, but it's real and you're feeling it. Mm -hmm. So it's like just validate that what whatever somebody feels is real and they're the expert in that. That's their realm. We can't tell them what they're feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so taking that super valuable information and actually using it as golden nuggets to mm -hmm. create the recovery program. Yeah. And so that's where integrative medicine means that the, the health professional and the client are equal team players on level playing fields. So it's not expert talking down the facts and the knowledge to the client yeah. and telling them what they should do or prescribing things. It's actually you're both equal with equal respect and equal honesty mm -hmm. and you're looking at, at what can work best, what are the options to achieve the very specific goals that that person wants for themselves mm -hmm. without judgment, obviously, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, I was, I was thinking back, like with sensory impairments, 
um, you know, people are essentially not enjoying being in their body or they hate their body or they want to run away from themselves because what they feel is terrifying. Mm -hmm. And if a doctor gives them a generic script, that's not going to heal the fact that they hate what they're living in yeah. and they can't run away from themselves. So it's, it, it's not a functional model. Mm -hmm. So it's until people can actually sleep well, love themselves, be kind to themselves, mm -hmm. treat themselves, gift themselves whatever it is they need and follow their desire in a way that they honor and recognize that they're worthy of, mm -hmm. that's when the healing happens. So you've, you've got to really learn to love this new body you're in because it's changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, a huge part of the recovery. And I often say allow 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. But, you know, sometimes it's it's quicker, sometimes it's longer. Um, what, what kind of treatments do you do for, for this kind of stuff, for like vertigo and stuff like that? Yeah, well, for both vertigo and tinnitus, it really is about getting back in the body and out of the head. Mm -hmm. Because the symptoms are error pathways that are being interpreted by the brain and the mind as a problem. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is actually reactivate steadiness, calm, peace, relaxation, safety. And a lot of those signals are actually in your body. Mm -hmm. So it's like when you feel your shoulders are above your hips, it's like, okay, well, that's my center. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, feeling your feet contacting the floor. So this is what we call proprioception. It's generally through the skin, but some of the muscles and spinal reflexes mm -hmm. tells our brain where our body is, where our leg is, where our arm is. And it also helps us to feel wind or feel gravity. And so using proprioception or touch the brain is getting signals about, okay, am I in danger? Like, is there a lion chasing me? Is there a tsunami? Is there an earthquake? Mm -hmm. Or am I safe? Yeah. And so a lot of the exercises are about re-educating the brain on the reality rather than the fear mm -hmm. or dare I say the illusion or the, even the delusion. Yeah. Because sometimes what our mind is telling us is really not based on fact at all. So mm -hmm. we need to kind of get in there and participate in the conversation and sort it out. Oh. And what about um, your your practice now? What do you what do you do now that you don't do five hours a day every day of yoga and stuff? Yeah, good question. Well, I have always been pretty committed to yoga teaching because it's it's a really great way to connect to the community. Mm -hmm. And I've only just recently let go of yoga teaching. So yeah. for the last ten years, I have been continuing to practice and teach. But now, because I have my vertigo and tinnitus seeking balance mm -hmm. career. I just decided it's all a bit much, so I have a local teacher here in Belbridge. You a, must be the only person in Victoria that's moving out of yoga teaching into a career. A, a career. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else is going the other way. Yeah, that's not a bad, that's not a bad thing. No, say it's that definitely <laughs> the right decision for me. My, mm -hmm. I mean, my vertigo and tinnitus career. So, Seeking Balance International is my business name. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have clients all over the world and I do a lot of private therapy or support people through self-study programs and it's all based on yoga philosophies. And in yoga, there's asana teaching, which is your classic yoga teaching, and there's also pratyahara, which is um, learning about the senses and withdrawal, so um, not letting sex, drugs and rock and roll take, take over your life, so having some sensory control. Mm -hmm. And that's really where I've specialized. So I'm very much still working in yoga. It's just not conventional yoga teaching in a studio. It's much more specialized therapy. Yeah. And I now go to my yoga teacher as a student and it's like such a gift. It's a relief, huh? <laughs> oh, because I can just like be in my body and nurture mm. my body for that two hours. Mm. And it's in the most amazing setting by, by Bell's Beach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so... I feel like it's such a treat, like, yeah. Yeah, cool. So that's, I've, I've gone back the other way. What about travel? Do you have any spiritual places other than Bells Beach that light you up spiritually? Mm, well, when I was 20, I lived in the north of Spain in a place called Santander mm -hmm. in Cantabria. And I, I would say that was where I probably had some of my first awakenings, mm -hmm. largely because I had my daily practice, of course, which for me was super normal. Um, but it was the first time I'd left my hometown, my regular group of friends, my parents, and was able to blossom in the world as an independent thinker. Mm -hmm. And I was traveling on my own, you know, working here and there, studying a bit of Spanish language and, you know, had to read the newspapers and get myself a place to live and go through like, um, share house interviews in Spanish. And so I really challenged myself mm -hmm. and I think, that process of really being out on my own in the world and and f 
it was a very spiritual connection because the only way I can describe it is I really felt like Mother Earth was holding me. Mm. Like, you know, I, I just had such trust in the goodness of humanity mm-hmm. and it can sound really naive, but I think I was quite a sensible traveler. I didn't, I took calculated risks. I was safe. Mm-hmm. And I, and I do really feel that, um, a lot of people are good, you know, mm. a, a lot, that not everybody's a terrorist or greedy or fear-based and out there to get you. And mm. I think that year really taught me about independence, certainly honoring desire. And I really, I remember traveling with this idea of karma mm-hmm. and never, ever taking anything for granted. So if somebody took me in and let me have a family meal with them or sleep Mm-hmm. at their place, which as a single traveling female, you get invitations all over. Like people are so happy to house you. Yeah. You know, I would always try and give them something back, whether it be I would write them a song on my guitar or, yeah. you know, buy a bottle of wine or do some housework. So I had this kind of real sense of give and take. Mm-hmm. And then I think I came back and went to university and, and definitely fell into some of the sex, drugs and rock and roll of the early 20s. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I can notice I lost that a bit. I became a bit more entitled and maybe a bit more um, Mm self-centered and I suppose going through that immaturity. But, yeah, I always look back at the Spain time and think I I was really in a nice, balanced, humble place Mm -hmm. knowing that I was vulnerable, you know. Yeah. You're in a foreign Mm -hmm. country learning the language and you have to have your wits about you and this you're constantly mindful. Mm Mm-hmm. And so, but that, you still felt you could relax enough to be held and and be and somehow see the magic in that experience. Definitely, mm. definitely, and it felt like magic happened every day, and I was so in tune with it. Mm-hmm. But then I think as I came back home into my familiar comfort zone, I lost a bit of that mindfulness, and I, you know, got stuck into some of the fashions or the group think or you know yeah, all yeah. of that that's part of individuation and becoming an adult. Mm-hmm. And so then I think when I got closer to 30 in my late 20s and 30s, I I probably did the full circle and, and you know, I did some travel in India, which was amazing, mm-hmm. which is another spiritual journey for me. And I Do studied... Do you have a favourite spot from India? Well, I was at the Iyengar Institute, which mm-hmm. was an amazing experience. Um, and I don't know if many people know about Iyengar Yoga, but that is the centre where Mr Iyengar and his family members teach and the classes mm-hmm. are packed and it is... Mm-hmm the opposite of what we would consider spiritual. Like people steal your props and, you know, like (laughs) it's hilarious. And like they ask the Indians are so playful. Mm -hmm. And um, I just loved it because they're giggling and they're poking and the Westerners are like rigid as anything and like trying to be on their best behavior. And the Indians are just so loose and friendly. And Mm -hmm. I really loved their playful approach to yoga rather than this rigid kind of you must do it correct yeah. Which I think is how it's been misinterpreted by some Westerners. Yes. But I actually wagged class one day because I got invited <laughs> to go hiking with some locals and we left at 4 a.m. They packed their gas cookers and I didn't really know what I was in for, but it was amazing. And we ended up hiking in monsoon up waterfalls and it was so windy that the waterfalls looked like volcanoes because they were blowing the water up. Yeah, right. And they were cooking chai and made all these amazing buffalo milk curd cake sweets and Mm. apparently the only reason I got invited on the hike was because someone lied and said it was my birthday so I got happy birthday (laughs) sung to me at the top of a mountain at sunrise Mm. and we hiked for 10 hours which was massive Mm. none of us had any hiking gear it was just in like my street assics yeah yeah and we got to this little village and they spoke to the villagers and it was all like um you know cow poo dung kind of really really old village Mm -hmm. no electricity no running water nothing and i'm thinking like if this was in australia we would be having two minute noodles like we would have packed something where you boil water Mm -hmm. and eat yeah these guys had whole coconuts and whole chunks of ginger and whole vegetables and we made a curry from scratch and flour we rolled rotis (laughs) we cooked them in a dirt um you know fire pit and these beautiful villages allowed us to use their kind of area to cook and Mm -hmm. i was like it was incredible. So that was, mm. that to me felt definitely as spiritual as spending time at the Iyengar Yoga Institute learning about, you know, the asanas and pranayama. But yeah, yeah the playfulness of, playfulness of the Indians really blew me away and I loved their mm. philosophy on life, mm-hmm. which is very much, I believe, just take advantage. Like yeah. you could get hit by a truck tomorrow mm. because the roads are so chaotic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
And, um, and yeah, I loved their zest for life and their endless energy to hike 10 hours and then cook an entire feast from scratch. Yeah, right. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing experience. Yeah. So mm. I, think, I think around the world they would be some of my favorite spiritual places. Mm-hmm. But truth be told, it's my body. Like my spiritual home mm-hmm. is my body, yeah. which comes with me anywhere. Mm-hmm. So location independent. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Um, what else? Is there anything else that you want to share before we wrap it up? Um, not really, but I think I love the aspect of the spiritual tradie representing that anyone can be spiritual Yeah, and I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you can lay bricks mindfully mm-hmm. and you can just pay attention to every plant in the garden and, and weather patterns. And that's what really I love about surfing is it connects you into the tides and the wind changes and. I love it when you're paddling out in the water. It doesn't matter how old you are. It, you know, you can have grey-haired old dudes and these young kids who are, you know, 10 years old and everyone's equal and everyone's respecting each other. And I just think that's – it's really special connection to nature, connection to spirituality, and it really does overcome gender, age, socioeconomic status, mm-hmm. even talent, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's just we're all in the same mm. world. Yeah. One of the biggest things for me, I guess, has been um, realizing that your spirituality isn't environment dependent. Like mm. you can be in the middle of a work site and if you continually self-referring and knowing yourself, then you don't have to become the binge drinking, cigarette mm. smoking, even though I was. Mm. You, can, you can release <laughs> those things and then still be who you are where you are and Mm -hmm. I guess the instinct when you first start to wake up is to leave the dirtiness of the world behind because it's just not I'm not that you know and and repel against it and I think the biggest lesson for me has been just to accept that I can be me and the world can be the world and there doesn't have to be this kind of fight Mm. against you know yeah that's that's the the lesson for me anyway and I love this Mm. concept of oneness that you know, we are all living, breathing, moving parts of Mother Earth. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we are Mother Earth. We're a part of her. Yeah. And um, I don't, I'm, I, I really try and practice coming back to this space of there's no right and wrong. Mm-hmm. There is no better and worse. There is no requirement for judgment. Everything just is. Mm-hmm. And you know what? We're making the best decision we can at that point in our life even if we look back at a different time and say, oh, I wouldn't do that again. Yeah. That didn't go so well. But I think every human is dealing with a physical, mental, emotional, spiritual story mm. and they're making choices that fit that story for them. Yeah. And it's not until the awakening comes and mentoring and friendships or maybe they listen to a podcast and, you know, yeah. something opens up for them and then their mm-hmm. physical, mental, emotional, spiritual story can shift and mm-hmm. – Um, yeah, and I really think there's no rush and there's no judgment and, um, the ironic thing about traumas, whether they be sexual traumas or physical traumas or emotional traumas is they often will open us up to a new way of viewing things. Mm -hmm. And if we can learn to love from that place of trauma, like it is enlightening Mm -hmm. because that's, you are cracked wide open and vulnerable and finding some way to love. Mm -hmm. I mean, that to me is like the biggest gift in the hardship. Yeah. And you can kind of, I suppose, that cliche rise above it. Mm -hmm. But it's not until you're really in that place and you go, wow, I have a choice here. Mm -hmm. Am I going to fight it or am I going to kind of surrender Mm -hmm. and hold my integrity, hold my empowerment? And so, yeah, I guess without the dark, we can't see the light. You know, you Mm -hmm. can't see the stars. If if it's daytime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. But yeah, if, if people are interested to um, learn more about what I do, you can visit seekingbalance.com.au. Mm-hmm. And that's got loads of resources and information on integrative medicine and neuroplasticity and in particular healing for vertigo and tinnitus. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Mm. And um, can you play the violin for us? Right now? Yeah. <laughs> that would be hilarious. <laughs> well, do you speak to that? So um, you're a musician as well. Yeah. A multi-talented musician. What do you play? What musicians do you know? What my f- musicians do you know? What instruments do you know? <laughs> <laughs> my first instrument is the fiddle. Mm-hmm. 
Um, is that the, what I call the violin? It's not yeah, the same, same thing, is it? Same, same. It is? It's just that um, violin, violinists usually play things like following music notation and crescendos and uh, musically dictated by somebody else, mm-hmm. whereas fiddlers play. Like I fiddle on the instruments. Like, so I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I play a lot of traditional old-timey or Celtic or, you know, these sort of things. Mm-hmm. And um, I guitar, sing a song, right, mm-hmm. mandolin and ukulele and I've just taken up the whistle because it's a great hiking instrument it's very mm-hmm. small cool and um yeah I mean for me music is such a joy yeah and mm. I you know I'm not a perfectionist or a professional I, I I play with it quite literally yeah um cool get it out let's play classic all right <laughs> classic I've, I've never I've, I've never done a fiddle recording this will be uh, fun yeah cool this is a exclusive spiritual tradie fiddle recording <laughs> <laughs> um. so my uh, violin was passed down from my great uncle, I think, mm. which is nice. Yeah. It might take me a while to tune it up. That's cool. The, um, the style of music that I love to scratch around with is literally very scratchy, mm-hmm. thus the fiddling component. Um, and, uh, yeah, some people don't even tune their instrument at all. <laughs> cool. So that's an old timey one called Angeline the Baker. Awesome. And I think if anyone's ever been to an old timey uh, festival, apparently they play that one on repeat for like an hour. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> Super cool. Th- Where are you from originally? Here. Here. The Surf Coast. Cool. So I left at the age of 18 and came back at the age of 30. So mm-hmm. I kind of went traveling the world and ended up coming back to my roots, which feels great. Awesome. Thank you very much for joining me on the podcast today. Mm, pleasure. Um, I, I was going to ask you if you have a, a last wisdom. I, I think you already did that on the last thing you said before you, you said where we can find you. But mm. You don't have any like favorite quotes or something from back in when you first started that inspired you to keep practicing or something like that? Um, my favorite quote I think is from Nina Simone, who's a jazz musician mm-hmm. and um, a black American woman political activist who's mm-hmm. passed. She died, I think, when I was 15. But she says, I got a lot of living to do before I die and I ain't got much time to waste. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one of my favorites. Cool. I like it. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> my pleasure. Have a great day. Um, I wanted to talk about the Shruti, but I don't know if I should. That, 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 and I don't know if I'm going to put this part on the podcast, mm-hmm. but um, yeah. What's that word? The shruti. It's, that's the sound in the ear ah. as, as, as I've learned. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, I don't know enough about it to speak about it. Mm-hmm. Like, like I know something about it. Well, but, I, I, yeah. I know some Indians do interpret tinnitus. So sounds in the bodies as the gods talking to them. Mm-hmm. So for them, it's a sign you're super blessed. Yeah. Um, and I know from a scientific point of view, your body is making sound and you can hear it. Mm-hmm. So it belongs there and it's healthy. Yeah. Um, but you can't confirm or deny whether it's the gods or not. Well, I have a different relationship to <laughs> gods to maybe other people. Mm-hmm. I really believe we are fully interconnected in oneness and in consciousness. Mm-hmm. And my version of God, I don't super use that word, but mm-hmm. connecting to that higher life force, mm-hmm. interconnected life force, it's bigger than me. Like it's in me. Yes. So I believe I can, I can hear things that are coming from a bigger... Source. So, for mm-hmm. example, if I have a problem in my life, I can ask that bigger source, help me. I can't figure this out on my own. Yeah. 
and I can connect into the answer. I can I can wait for it. I can allow it in. Mm-hmm. So in that context, like maybe I can hear the gods. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, but yes. I don't really use that language. I'm, I I really believe in like a a big almost invisible network of um, like, you know, spider webbing, mm-hmm. which is our consciousness. And we are all interconnected, even though we can't see it. Yeah. And so this idea of there's so much knowledge out there that's invisible and not in books, but we can connect to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really like exploring ancient cultures like in Egypt and mm. some of those. Do you know a lot about ancient, ancient Egypt cultures? My brother knows more. <laughs> you can talk with him. Yeah. But he's since breaking his neck and becoming quadriplegic and he was pretty competitive as a in sport and um, surfing and rock climbing and skiing and whatever. So he had to shift gears and Mm -hmm. he's, I've, you know, shared the journey with him as not only his sister, but kind of one of his primary carers Mm -hmm. and seeing his mind open up to, okay, well, can't really use my muscles anymore. So he's like, well, what's my mental capacity? And so looking Mm -hmm. at manifestation and studying ancient Egypt and, Mm -hmm. Um, that's been really rich and rewarding hearing his perspective. And so we can talk for hours on this yeah. consciousness awakening and, um, Do you think he'd be up for a chat? Definitely. Cool. Yeah. He's worth, he's worth talking to, mm-hmm. but yeah, I think we are only ever limited by our own belief systems. Mm. And, you know, if you view yourself as a bad person and unworthy and life is shit, that's exactly what you're going to see. Mm-hmm. But if you view yourself as fully beautiful and loved and connected and inherently belonging on this planet Mm. and supported, Mm -hmm. you're going to see belonging and support and love Mm -hmm. because that's the filter you're viewing life through. Yeah, absolutely. So Mm. I think our consciousness and our beliefs is really so very powerful. And I'm definitely haven't figured it all out. I have mood swings and moments and then I catch myself out and go, okay, I can choose here. You know, Mm -hmm. am I going to go down the, the route of like righteousness and judgment and self hatred or, you know, whatever hating, Mm -hmm. or am I going to drop into compassion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eat some humble pie and go, you know what? I could look at this differently Mm -hmm. and yeah, just slow down the breathing and open up the heart. Mm -hmm. And that's, I'm, I'm sure that that will be something I'm doing for the rest of my life. Like, I think you got in and out of it. Yeah. That's my experience. Mm-hmm. So, um. I feel like you're going forever deeper. It's just that you might feel like you, you're coming out, but you're still, mm-hmm. you're still deep. You know, you never go backwards. Yeah. I, I think, don't think. I think I agree with that. Mm. I feel like all the work we do on healing ourselves and ultimately the, it's the relationship to ourselves. It's a really big mm-hmm. part of the work I do with my clients. Mm-hmm. It's like, how do we love the parts of ourselves we don't like? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the ugly warts and pimples mm-hmm. and, or even, you know, moodiness or jealousy or mm. um, talkativeness. Like, how do we love all of ourselves and how do we create space? Mm. And how do we honor ourselves even when perhaps we do feel remorse or guilt because we did something that was like mm-hmm. not ideal? And, I think the more we can heal our relationship to ourselves, the more we heal the whole planet. Mm -hmm. And this is that interconnective that you can't undo the healing. The healing's done. Yeah. And then as you're ready. There's more to be done though. (laughs) More more bubbles to the surface. Mm -hmm. And I I firmly believe that you you only ever experience the healing that you're ready for. Mm -hmm. So if there's traumas and things inside of us that we're not yet ready to face Mm. or process the body is so clever it will suppress it like we don't even know it's there it's just hidden in the back of our brain yeah until the day comes when it's like yep i'm ready for this Mm -hmm. and then it comes up and you cry it out you yell it out whatever Mm -hmm. and suddenly you you make peace with that Mm. so yeah that's where i see it so i won't i won't (laughs) i won't talk about the shruti (laughs) but we'll have to look I'm, i'm gonna look into it Mm, I want yeah, to, I want to even find out more about it. Maybe after your Indian adventure, yes, uh, share with me what you learned. I'll see if I see any any if I can see the if I can see the tinnitus, like <laughs> like see it like visually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those, I'm I've no doubt that you mm. can do that. Do you meditate? Yeah, definitely. And mm-hmm. I I love meditating very much in the body. I, I did vipassana and I connected quite well with that Mm because it was very consistent with my yoga training of of observing what shows up and constantly being connected to the body rather than necessarily going through a script of visualizing a waterfall or unicorns or rainbows but much more like okay what am I noticing in my present reality Mm -hmm. 
and also meditating on what are the things I really want to feel what's my heart really connected to today and how can I connect with that more deeply in the here and now Mm -hmm. so that's kind of and I I do a lot of writing well not a lot but every day I try and write down as a meditation to clear my mind and clear my thoughts and I suppose catch myself out if I'm in avoidance patterns or procrastination. Mm -hmm. Um, And because I do run a business, you know, it's just keeping myself accountable to little projects I've got bubbling. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's more the meditation. And as far as pranayama goes, I do incredibly simple Mm -hmm. breath observations. I don't do any of the deep kumbhakas or couple of bodies because they are quite, that's the kind of (laughs) yeah, yeah, the heavy stuff. That can actually be quite hard on a woman's body. It's mm-hmm. not great for your uterus. Yeah. So I do. I'm a very gentle approach to both yoga, yoga asana, and yoga pranayama. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. All right. I'm gonna we'll end it again here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. Absolute pleasure. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs>